Welcome back to the channel. In this episode, I'm gonna go through a couple of different things. I'm gonna start off covering the state machine because I feel like we've been talking about the routing slip and I wanna cover the state machine that's used to initiate and track that routing slip. And then I'm gonna go and show how we can trace through the application. And for that, I'm gonna use the built-in support for open telemetry that's included with mass transit. And I'm gonna go ahead and spin up a Yager instance, Jaeger, Yager, we'll, we'll just call it Jaeger, and show you what those traces look like and so we can see how that routing slip executes. So let's just jump in, you know, if you haven't watched the earlier episodes, definitely watch those first, that'll give you some more information. But this is gonna cover these two things. So the state machine is a built-in feature of mass transit where you can create sagas that are state machines. State machines can observe events. And in this case, I have a number of different events that I'm processing within that state machine. So let's kind of start from the top and kind of show how those events are handled. So initially, which these are events that can actually create a state machine instance, when an event registration is received, which is this registration received record, which is a registration detail, this has all of the details of the submission. And most of these events actually inherit from registration details, so I don't have to cut and paste them all the time. Um, just something I like to do. In fact, I probably could take that out of the uh, topology so that it doesn't get created on the broker. Um, now I'm gonna go up to the registration received and go back to here. So what's gonna happen when the saga first receives this? So the consumer that handles the controller method it just simply validates the input and then publishes the registration received event. So what's the saga gonna do? Inside this saga, we're gonna first initialize and copy all of the data out of that event into our saga instance so that that data is saved in the database or whatever the saga repository we're using is. And we're gonna dump out a simple log message with that submission ID and email address. After we've copied that off, the next step in the behavior is we're going to initiate processing. So we do that by publishing the process registration message, which this is a command, we publish commands. Yes, I know, super exciting. But we're gonna publish this command so that the consumer can then build that routing slip and execute it. And we've covered that consumer in the other episode, so jump to those if you need to look back at that. Um, at this point, we transition to that received state. So that's gonna put that Saga state machine into a received state. And the nice thing about using a Saga to front end the routing slip is because the routing slip is going to run across the network. Then the state that goes with that transaction and that routing slip is carried with that message that's in that routing slip. So the Saga doesn't know anything about it. It doesn't know what's happening. It just knows that it started it and it's received the registration, it's out there being processed somewhere. When that routing slip completes or fails or whatever, those events that are then sent back to the state machine will allow us to transition to those other states. So we're gonna sit in this receive state, and right now if we were to go to our API controller and ask for the state of this, we would get this registration status requested event. And that simply just has a submission ID that we wanna get the status for. And so when that comes in, we're just doing a quick response with the registration status, which is our status model that includes all of the details of the saga. Now, an interesting thing about this event in the saga is if I go up and look at how I define that event, you'll notice the others I don't define, and there's a reason for that, and I'll show you in a second. But the reason I define this one special is because I want to say it's read-only. I don't plan on changing the state. So I can hint the Saga repository to say, hey, I'm not going to change anything, so don't write it back out. Don't try to save changes async or any of that. Just let it go. I'm just reading. Save, save the transaction overhead, all that stuff. It also lets me specify a missing instance. So if they fire a request for a submission ID that doesn't exist in the Saga repository, I can just fault and that'll throw that failure back to the request client and then they can do like a 404 not found on that API endpoint, which is exactly what I do. I said I would talk about the correlation stuff. Let me cover that real quick. So this get registration status, 
it has to correlate back to the state machine somehow. And I'm using a feature I called a module initializer inside my contracts assembly. And in here, I'm telling Mass Transit what the correlation ID is for every one of these message types. And in this case, it's submission ID. And the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want to have to specify this elsewhere in the system. I want the correlation ID to always be based off this submission ID because that's how these messages get correlated to that Saga instant. So that's a super useful way to kind of configure that in one place in your contract so that they're set up correctly. Now, if you have multiple GUIDs in a message type and different Sagas could correlate using different properties in there, I don't recommend doing that because then you'll be confused by the magic. And even though in here, in the Saga, I could actually specify the correlation. I could say correlate by ID, and this would be m.message.submissionID. I could totally do that, and it would have the same effect. It's just I would have to do that for every event. So if you do have events that have multiple GUIDs in them, don't you know, assume what the correlation ID is. Just let the state machine specify it. When in doubt, get explicit. Um, so now that that state machine is in that received state, if we remember from the consumer, which I closed, I am creating a number of different event subscriptions that are going to go back to that saga depending upon what happened, such as the verification failure, the payment failure, or the registration completed. And all of those events are defined here at the bottom of the saga. Completed, verification failed, and payment failed. So what's going to happen is while I'm in that received state, whichever one of those I get, I'm then going to process and transfer to a different state. So for instance, registered, everything was great. I'm going to log out that I registered. I'm going to copy those variables out. I mentioned in a previous episode how that worked. I'm pulling that data from the event variables of the routing slip completed and storing those in the saga. Invalid license, I'm just logging. Payment failed, I'm just logging because ultimately those are going to transition to a suspended state where this registration is suspended. It needs some user intervention, maybe a corrected license downstream, whatever. The reason I go into suspended is because while I'm suspended, they can resubmit that registration with the same submission ID and say, okay, process this again. I've updated my license. I've you know, done whatever it is I needed to do and initiate that processing again. So that'll allow us to retry with a brand new routing slip that same registration as a separate transaction. So, and since the transaction completes or fails as a whole, it's only going to do the work if it actually makes sense. So that's how the saga works and how the saga is keeping track of that. Now I want to cover how we can see that visibly. So I'm going to pop over to our Postman test client. And you can see here I've created a valid registration. It's going to create an event. It's got my license number. It's got my email. I'm going to go ahead and send this, and we're going to see that run in the background. I get a new submission ID. If I go over here and look at the run, I can see that the worker service did its work. It's done the payment for $15. It's registered. Everything is great. If you remember in another episode, we made it so it's cheaper if you have a license. Super exciting stuff. Um, but now I'm going to go back to Postman. I'm going to click on that status link. I'm going to get that status. And you can see that I'm registered. You know, my expiration date is in the saga. You know, it expires in 90 days. Uh, I have the registration ID, which is the GUID for the actual event registration that was captured from that variable. All of that data is in there where I need it. Super stoked about that. How can I see what this looks like? So I talked about the open telemetry support of mass transit at the intro, and then I would cover it, and then I would use Jaeger to visualize it. So within the state machine, within both of the services, I've added an extension method that's going to add all of the open telemetry support. Now, this is, this is overblown. This has everything. This has metrics. This has tracing. This has everything configured right now and mass transits included. ASP.NOR, core, SQL client, everything is traced. Uh, and I outport this to, to Jaeger. And I have a Jaeger instance running locally. So if I jump over to that instance and hit find traces, I can actually see that there are two traces right now in here. Well, one was that Jason Wagger because I fired up Postman. But 
Here I have a 28 span trace that covers everything that I just did as far as registering and a separate span for when I got the status of that registration. So let's look at this one because this is the mind blower. So this is how that routing slip executes start to finish. You can see that the API kicks up. This is with ASP.NET Core. It does a send to the submit registration exchange in RabbitMQ, which then gets picked up by the registration service. You see we cross the service boundaries. We then go down into registration received, which this is the send from that consumer that processed that. And if we wanna look at this, we can come in here and look and say, oh, that was the submit registration consumer that processed that message, submit registration. All of that data is in there, all of the tags are stored. So let's go down here and see what happens when the state machine receives that event. Now we get all of the details we want in here. This is just the receive because the way OpenTelemetry works with messaging is you have two things. You have receive and process. So the process would be the actual consumer. The receive is the transport receiving it. And we can see that registration state is that state machine receiving it. We can actually see, because we're tracing SQL, we can see where it tried to query an existing instance from the repository. And then we can see where we passed it to the saga. And this is kind of cool because I can see, okay, well, it, it started in the initial state because it didn't exist. And the state machine ended in receive. It's the registration state machine. And we process the registration received event. Now this all goes down and I'm not gonna look at every single one of these, but I, if you remember, we produced that event called process registration, which gets sent out and processed by that consumer that builds the routing slip. The first activity in our routing slip is that license verification send. Now I'm gonna advance the timeline a little bit here to kind of drag this out and so we can see the right side a little better. Um, but the license verification process we can see is the license verification activity. The arguments that we received, those license verification arguments, and then that's what processed that, how long it took, what its start time was into the total process. All of that is there, and after it processes it, you can see that it sends it immediately to the next activity, execute registration. The event registration then completes and then sends it to the process payment execute endpoint. And then ultimately, we see a send to the registration state, which we can go look at and see it's that routing slip completed event which we actually have as a registration completed event, which is a variant of that. So this has given us the kind of full view of how that's picked up. Now at that point, the state machine receives it. The state machine processes it. And we can see we went from the received to the registered state. And we can also see, you know, we can actually see all the SQL data of like committing the transaction and everything. But that, that gives us a full end-to-end -end view of how that routing slip executes. And we can see each step that it went through. And you'll notice it's choreographed through those activities. It isn't going back to the saga in each one and saying, who do I do next? Who do I next? There is no central controller. It's passed through those endpoints with all the state being carried with it. And only once it's completed is it then going back to the saga to tell it what happened at the end of the process. And then when I query that state, it's just a simple query. The registration state machine receives it. It processes it. It calls send on the bus with that uh, response message of, where is it? It produced the message type, registration at service bus dot send. There should be a message type in there. Oh, it is contracts, registration status. Got it. Oh, and registration detail. because There's more than one type. Um, yeah. Then it gets processed, we process that response, and it gets handled back and out to the controller API. So that's a really great way to look at how the processes work. It's really easy to spin up Jaeger locally. Um, and, and you can see kind of how all that works and see where everything goes. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you on the next one.